In November 2014, I made a video about free software and did some video editing. And then uh, people have said since, would you ever go back to editing with free software? And um, I tried and failed miserably, but then I found that Rob is doing editing on free software. So Rob, what have you got? Uh, well, so I, before I started my channel, I'd never edited any video at all. Um, so I just got started with Caden Live. K is it KDN Live? Caden Live? I don't know how it's pronounced. I said Caden Live because this is the piece of software I used actually. Right, and that's kind of why I used it because I hadn't heard of, I hadn't gotten into open source video editing before. I heard it was fairly good, it was the one you'd used, so you know, I went for that. How does it work? What, what so this is a video that I just um, uploaded just recently, which is fairly typical. I don't know. I think it's quite standard, but on the other hand, I have no idea because I have never done video editing before. Well, from my point of view, that looks like a very sensible looking timeline. It's like using different tracks for different things. Can you show us a bit of what, what sort of thing you've been doing with it then? Like here, for example, I'm compositing in some thumbnails of the other of the computer file videos because it's relevant to those. Back in the day, these would have been annotations, you know, they would be clickable. YouTube doesn't do that anymore. Sad times. Talk us through the hardware then. What, what, have, you, what have you had to use to... The hardware is um, this. Did you make this specially? I did, yeah. Um, just because I didn't have a desktop at all, I tried using my laptop, this one, which is just really, really not up to it on account of being... Um, extremely light and thin and just not made for any kind of heavy lifting. Um, so I put together this machine and it's pretty um, it's pretty standard. Here's me looking at the components that I'm putting in it. Oh, uh, okay. So it is it's fairly off-the-shelf stuff, right? Yeah, pretty standard. The only thing I wanted was a lot of RAM. It's got 16 gig of RAM so that I'm not going to run out doing basic video editing and a solid state drive. I have a 240 gig solid state drive to do that holds my files temporarily while I'm working on them for performance and then a terabyte of hard disk to keep the, sorry, two terabytes apparently. It says here two terabytes, I'm looking at the video again. <laughs> One thing that I run up against is my lack of experience with GNU Linux distros and it, the, the irony is that that was kind of what I was testing out throughout all of this. Sure. So um, talk us through what you've got going there because you know a lot more about these sorts of things than I do. Yeah, so I use, um, I've been through a lot of different distributions. I started off with Ubuntu um, because everybody starts off with Ubuntu. And then um, what else did I try? I went to Crunchbang because I thought Ubuntu, Ubuntu got really, I think it got really heavy past a certain point. It, it was including too much stuff and being too graphical and in your face. And um, I used Linux Mint for a while because that was very nice. Um, what I'm using here is Manjaro, which is based on Arch. Um, but Arch is a real, Arch is like. <sighs> I, look, I'm, I know people get almost religious about these things. Yeah, not, there's no almost about it. People, people get literally unambiguously religious about these things. But you're a real console jockey. Could anybody use this kind of uh, distro? Or is this kind of a, I mean, I mean, I don't use that term in a derogative way, but I know you know what you sure. do with the console. And yet me, I, I need GUIs, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the console is my preferred way of interacting with my computer most of the time. Um, but, uh, right, right. So I'm running Manjaro, right, which is Arch based. Uh, but Arch, you kind of have to build from the ground up. The idea of Arch is by the time you have a running Arch Linux installation, you really understand Linux because you have to. You know, you've sort of, it, it, it's not like you hit install and then you go off and have a cup of tea and come back and you're done. You have to actually make all of the decisions and run the commands to set up the system. So is this like you are compiling your own kernels and stuff? Uh, not quite. But it's that kind of thing, yeah. You're, you're, you're putting a lot of time into it. So you have complete control, you have complete customization, everything is exactly how you want it, but you've got to know what you're doing. Whereas Manjaro is um, Arch-based, but um, has some sensible defaults. So somebody's done some of that work for you. Yeah, so you can still use the Arch repositories and things in the Arch um, wiki, which is amazing. Like the Arch wiki is so good for all kinds of information about all kinds of software and Linux things. Um, but you don't have to sit there and 
go through this long installation process and all of these decisions that you're not really sure what you want, you know. So that's um, so that's Manjaro. I kind of I do like it. The update thing, it's very um, it's a rolling release thing. So you're continuously getting updates. It's not like you then install the next version. It's like every day there's a couple of updates and your system continually updates. Um, but that does mean sometimes stuff can just break because some update has broken compatibility with something with something else and you have to sit there and figure it out when you want it to be doing work. That was something that got me a little bit was that I had a workflow already in place. So you've kind of set a workflow up from scratch. Has that workflow broken sometimes because of this? Have you, have you been kind of back to square one sometimes? Um, I had a problem with the laptop actually where an update broke my USB microphone. It broke, um, I ended up in a weird situation where the USB audio kernel module was not present anymore because it had upgraded past itself or something. Um, and I wasn't sure. It turns out it was fine, but it made me very nervous because um, because the, the, the modules I had were for a different version of the kernel. So I guess the kernel had updated and that had removed the old modules and replaced them with the new ones. But I hadn't been paying attention when I was running the updates, so I didn't know if my system was actually OK yeah. or if there was some serious problem. It turns out I rebooted, everything was fine. Uh, it booted up with the new kernel version, it found the new kernel modules, everything worked perfectly well. But because I wasn't sure if I'd completely destroyed my system accidentally with an update, I couldn't trust that if I rebooted it, it would actually come up. Um, so I made a full backup while it was running and stuff like that, just to, you know, to be on the safe side. Um, but that did cost me some time, obviously. And anyone sensible would have had a continuous update process and would have not cared at all if at any moment their machine exploded. Um, and you know, always drink enough water and get your five vegetables a day and wake up at 6 a.m. for a run, but not everybody's like that. I'm most comfortable doing most of my work in a terminal or a text editor. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're doing graphics or video, you need uh, a user interface, a uh, graphical user interface. But most of the time I find a terminal is more, is more efficient. It's got, a, it's got a learning curve, obviously, but when you're good with it, I think you can be better and faster than doing it through a GUI most of the time. And I think people who are really good with GUIs don't actually use the mouse very much, right? They learn the keyboard shortcuts. And so if you're learning how to do everything on a keyboard anyway, you don't really need all the little buttons. It's kind of a, it's like a, is it Wittgenstein's ladder? Some philosopher's ladder. You, you climb up the ladder and then you throw it away when you're done with it, right? Great. But if you can climb, you don't need the ladder. Um, so, but yes, Manjaro is usually uh, easier to use than this because I run a tiling window manager called Awesome Window Manager, which I like because it makes efficient use of the screen space. So here you see I've got my text editor here, which is Sublime. I have two terminals. And if I want another terminal, I open it and it opens right here. Mm -hmm. So the number of pixels on this screen that aren't one of the programs I'm using is, is almost none, right? Whereas if I put it into uh, here, now it's in a more sort of normal mode where I can move the, the windows all like this and I can be like, oh, now I'm in this, this program, now I'm in that program. Like this is closer to the way that people usually use. Windowing systems. Right, but a lot of the time I've got windows that are over the top of one another, they're obscuring one another. I've got bits of my screen where I'm not, where no. there's nothing. So that's how I do most of my stuff. And you can obviously, you can adjust these, like you can move them in and out and change their size relative to each other for whatever you need. Yeah, that's the window manager. It's called Awesome and I like it a lot. But the point is, if I were using Ubuntu with Awesome Window Manager, what you would see on the screen would be basically identical because the window manager is determining pretty much everything on the screen. So the fact that I'm using Manjaro underneath isn't that relevant from uh, an aesthetic 
uh, perspective. And showing my complete ignorance here, but what what exactly would be different under the hood then for a completely different distro? Um, it's the way, it's the choices of software that do the the system level stuff. Like it, with something like with something like Windows, everything, pretty much everything, it comes from Microsoft until you get up to user space. Like you get to choose, you know, which web browser you use, but it comes with the one file explorer and one like, I don't know, file system, uh, network manager, like all of the bits that build the operating system, they come with it and they are not really removable or interchangeable. Whereas Linux, you have the kernel, which actually doesn't do that much. And then everything else that makes up the operating system is other pieces of software, the other projects made by other people. Um, and you can, what a distribution does is it picks a load of those that work well together and puts them all together into a distro um, with you know, sensible configuration so that they all know about one another and you know, ideally, and they all work together well. Um, but any part of that system could in principle be pulled out and replaced by a different program that does the same job. It's just like that, the standard thing where you can choose, you can choose how you're going to, you know, what your web browser is. You can choose whether you're going to use, you know, uh, LibreOffice or, or Microsoft Word. It's that, but all the way down, uh, almost all the way down. Uh, I had a phase as a teenager, I think a lot of people did, where I was really into it and I learned everything about how to put my system together and all the different little bits. And now all of that knowledge is out of date and useless because I didn't keep up with it. Because once I found an operating system set up that works for me, I, I realized I don't care. Um, it's interesting, but there comes a point where you're using your system to work and you want to use whatever works, right? The thing is, this just worked. I need to emphasize that because I, 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 built, this, I built this PC, I put it together, it booted the first time we expected it to, you know, and then I installed Manjaro on it uneventful process. I used, you know, I literally just went uh, Pac-Man, minus S, Caden Live, enter. That's the one thing that changes the package manager, like different distributions obviously use different repositories and different package managers. So you get your software from different places. They all do roughly the same thing though. Um, but anyway, I just installed Caden Live and it worked off the bat. Like I, I import my videos, I import my audio, I sync them up, I edit them. I hit export and I use, here it is, I don't hit export, I hit render. I go to this one, I just did the WebM because that's normal. And it has all these extra options about, you know, how you're going to do the, you know, what the exact command is and all of this stuff. I ignored all of that. I hit render to file. It renders, it's perfect. You upload it to YouTube, it knows what to do. Like I didn't have to uh, it worked out of the box, is what I'm saying. It was, and so it's weird because our experiences were so different and I don't know what to make of it because it's not as though I did anything brilliant. You know what I mean? It's not like I did some clever thing that made it all work or I hit a bunch of difficulties that I then knew exactly what to do because I'm so whatever. I just, it just worked for me, so. But I would also argue that people have been working on all of these bits of software and also that you know what you're doing with repositories and updating different um, modules and you've used a completely different operating system. Sure. And like, so yeah, like I know those things. Like I have that knowledge, some of it but I didn't have to use it. I suppose what I mean by that isn't necessarily that you've been tweaking because of course you've just told us you haven't, but my, my experience was that the distro that I used with the particular version of Kdine Live on the particular hardware that I had did work out of the box, but not in all the areas I needed it to. That's interesting. And rendering out was one of the areas I needed it to work. So, uh, so one of the things, one of the, one of the decisions you make when you're choosing a distro is there's always a trade-off between being up to date and being stable, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. And Arch and Arch-based distributions generally are, they call them bleeding edge, right? Because generally speaking, you get the latest version of the software. So having the latest version, you're probably going to have the most stable 
you're going to have the most bug fixes in place, but also the most new features that people are trying out. And a lot of software projects do use a system where they have major releases. Well, I, say, I used a long-term support release of Ubuntu. Exactly, uh, exactly. However, it was 1204, which people were telling me was out of date at the time. It wasn't the latest major release. Well, it was, I think, they, uh, I think the latest long-term release at the time was 14.0 something. Okay. Uh, and I couldn't get that to work at all. Ah. So the long-term release didn't work. Now, I'm not going to open up the hornet's nest, but I will just say that I believe it to be something to do with graphics card drivers, and I shall walk away at that point. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, this is the kind of thing, I do, I do feel really bad for people who have to deal with that, like the, pe the, the people who work in who work on open source software, mm. having to deal with the fact that people are going to install graphics cards which are undocumented, right? Like yeah, yeah. the manufacturers keep as a closely guarded secret exactly how it works, and it, they don't provide a driver, or if they do, that driver is just a binary blob that you can't, you know, you, you can't look inside, it doesn't tell you any useful information, and they have to make something that works flawlessly with this tremendous, like GPUs are fantastically complicated would be like or how it would be implemented or whatever. The idea of this paper is that it it lays out some problems that we can tackle now which will be helpful now and uh, that I think will be helpful later on as well with more advanced AI systems and making them safe as well.